distinguished uh, guests, ladies and, and gentlemen, uh, good morning. My name is uh, Andrew Pitson, I'm the Deputy Representative of the uh, British Office in uh, Taipei, uh, and I'm delighted to have the uh, opportunity to talk for a few minutes uh, about the UK's climate um, policy um, in light of uh, uh, Professor Joe's um, uh, fantastic thought-provoking presentation. Um, we are honoured uh, to be asked as, uh, as the UK to give an example um, uh, for, for, for Taiwan to factor in as Taiwan takes its, its decisions um, going forward. As, as was mentioned at, at the start, I'm, a, uh, I'm not a climate expert, I'm a, I'm a diplomat, but increasingly climate questions are becoming a core part of, of diplomacy. Um, I've been in diplomacy now for 16 or 17 years. And I think there are sort of two key moments where it felt that climate was pushing away other, the, the other traditional kind of topics that we were talking about in, in diplomacy. And, and that was first of all uh, ahead of the Copenhagen Climate Summit in, in 2009, where it felt, particularly in Europe, there was a real groundswell of opinion that we really needed to do much more uh, to tackle climate change. Uh, and, and then again now, uh, with, the, with the current movements that are running, with uh, the momentum built up by Greta Thunberg, which we're all seeing uh, her going to uh, New York and the UN General Assembly. So, so certainly in, in the UK, but also around the world, things are, things are, are really sort of, the pressure is increasing, I think. Um, this, before I, I get onto my, my main presentation, I, I just wanted to mention offshore wind, and offshore wind was obviously mentioned in, in Professor Joel's presentation. Uh, on Friday, this is uh, this is my photography, not very professional, but this was uh, this is Miao Li. So on Friday, I went for the um, groundbreaking of Formosa 2's onshore uh, onshore facility, so where they were going to put put in the transition uh, transition station. Uh, and then today there is a, a big event um, where Formosa One's electricity and power is coming is coming onshore. So uh, Taiwan was obviously quite far down in the uh, renewables table at the moment, but there is great potential for, for, for that to increase. Taiwan um, has a real opportunity, I think, with, with offshore wind, um, not only for Taiwan but also um, to become a regional hub. Japan and South Korea are thinking about offshore wind, as is Vietnam, uh, but Taiwan is, a, is ahead of the game. So I think there's both um, uh, policy, great policy potential, but also great commercial potential for Taiwan. And this is just a, a 15 second, so we move from the, the onshore wind on the left to, to the offshore wind um, on the right. I was struck by how close the turbines were to the to the sea. But you can you can hear how windy it is, so there's definitely there's definitely a good place for, for the turbines as well as uh, wave power as well. I'm, I'm going to talk um, about three topics briefly uh, that touch on, on some of uh, the, the, the reports. Uh, so I want to talk about the, the UK's Climate Change Act 2008 uh, and within that we set up a committee on climate change. I also want to talk about um, Net Zero, which is our recent commitment that we will uh, reduce uh, our climate emissions by 100% of our 1990 levels by 2050. And then I want to just talk briefly at the end about efforts we're making to green our uh, industry and our, and our companies. So the, Cli the Climate Change Act, this is the, the, the key piece of legislation that underpins the UK government's uh, commitments on, on, on climate change. I, I should say, we in the UK, like you in Taiwan, are um, quite close to a, a general election. Um, so I can't speculate too much on what future government policy will be, but I can certainly talk about what we've, what we've done in, in, in the past. Um, so the, the Climate Change Act in, in 2008 followed growing pressure for us to do more uh, in, in the UK. There was um, the, the Act itself uh, requires the UK to reduce uh, our carbon emissions from our 1990 levels by 80%. 
So that was what was first agreed in, in 2008. The initial figure that was being discussed was 60%, but there was great pressure from, uh, from NGOs, um, also from other partner countries and from politicians within the UK to push that up uh, to, to 80%, so we were more ambitious. It also came on the back of quite a lot of discussions within the EU, where in 2007, the EU agreed at what, what they referred to as a 20-20-20. So that was 20% reductions of the 1990 levels by 2020, that every, every country in the EU's energy mix would include at least 20% renewable, and that we would reduce our overall consumption. Uh, by, by 20%. So, so that was partly uh, the driver for, for our climate change act as, as well. So, so the goal in the climate change act is, is the emissions target, which was originally 80% of 1990 levels, but, but now has been amended, and I'll come on to that, um, just this year to 100%. The way this was to be achieved was by what we called carbon budgets. So we set five carbon budgets, uh, from 2008, I think, till 2032, um, we, we set out how much reduction, how, how much carbon emission reduction we needed to uh, reduce in, in that period. We are now in our third carbon budget, and we have so far met our targets for the first and second. So in 2018, we reduced our carbon emissions by 44% of uh, 1990 levels, so we're 44% of, of, of the way there. Another important um, element of the Climate Change Act was this recommendation to set up uh, the Committee on, on Climate Change. So this is, and I, I, will, come, I will come on to that, this, this body uh, has become very important in the UK. Um, both in terms of recommending policy to government, but also uh, monitoring and holding to account. So the Committee on Climate Change is uh, an independent statutory body. So statutory means set, set out in, in, in law, but it is independent from, from government. There were calls when the Act was being negotiated to, uh, to oblige the government to, to take account of uh, the recommendation, but, but in the end it was just agreed that it would be, uh, they would make recommendations and then it was the government to decide what to do with it. But given that it was included in the Act, the government was always going to take it very seriously. So there are eight, uh, there are eight committee members, and these are, these are, are drawn um, from, from politics, uh, from academia, from business, um, from engineering. So they are supposed to represent uh, a whole range of, 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 of expertise. So they are bringing that expertise, but they are also bringing contacts and ways in to the sectors that they, they need to be talking to um, uh, about change. The body is um, jointly sponsored by uh, a government department, so the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, so the, the most equivalent uh, government department here is MOEA, um, but also the devolved administration, so that's Scotland, Wales and, and Northern Ireland in the UK. And as, as I mentioned, it provides independent advice and it monitors progress and does uh, periodic reports against the objectives that we set out in our, in our carbon budgets. It also has a role in getting the UK to prepare uh, for the impact of, of climate change. Uh, Professor Joe was talking about flooding. Uh, it, just last week in the UK, uh, the top of the news was around flooding uh, in Sheffield in, in the north of England, and we're seeing increasing examples of, of that. So there's always also a preparedness element. One of the Committee on Climate Change's key recommendations um, last year was that the government moves to net zero. So this 100% reduction of our emissions from 1990 levels. And this was based partly um, on extensive scientific research from the Intergovernmental Panel on, on Climate Change and the, the Paris Accords, um, partly on their own expertise and a view that if the UK was to fulfil its commitments towards the Paris Goals in ensuring that, that 
The global temperature didn't rise by more, more than 2%, and ideally much closer to 1.5%. We needed to do that. Um, we needed to do that as a, as a minimum. So this recommendation um, was made. Uh, they claimed that net zero was necessary, and we had to do it. Feasible, it was possible, we could do this. Um, and we could continue to grow our economy, so, so cost effective. So the, the Committee on Climate Change works with various bodies representing different sectors in the UK. And one of the most important, as would be in Taiwan, is industry. So uh, they, they talk regularly to the Confederation of British Industry. So the, the CBI uh, is, is hugely important, hugely influential, uh, is probably the equivalent of the Chinese Industrial Federation. That would be the sort of closest uh, equivalent. So whenever the government announces any policy, whatever the CBI says is hugely important. Um, some people might have expected industry not to be in favour of this, but they were, they were hugely positive. So the head of the CBI said, UK business stands squarely behind the government's commitment to achieve net zero by 2020. This is the right response to the global climate crisis and firms are ready to play their part in combating it. They made clear that it wasn't necessarily going to be easy. Um, so some sectors will need clear pathways to enable investment in low carbon technologies and it's vital that there's cross-government coordination on the policies and regulation needed to deliver a clear future. So the message from business was very clear. We want to play our parts. We want to support this, but you are, as, as government, we expect certain things. So we expect support, we expect pathways, we expect uh, regulatory frameworks, um, and R&D, for example, funding in R&D, so funding uh, to, to ensure that the, the new technologies are, su are successful. Well, one, one example, one quick example of that is, is Drax. So this was. Um, one of our largest power stations in the UK, uh, totally, 10, 12 years ago, totally uh, reliant on, on, on coal. Uh, and, but it has, over that period, significantly uh, reduced its reliance on coal and con converted to using sustainable um, biomass. And now it's one of the leading research centres in, in carbon uh, capture technology. So it's just an example of that, that sort of uh, transformation. One other thing that I, I briefly wanted to um, mention before finishing was the government's encouragement of companies uh, to think about the impact that their company has on the environment as well as think about the impact of climate change on their, their companies. So our government now has formally uh, asked companies to uh, disclose in line with the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, which many of you will, will be aware of, uh, company information. And our Bank of England director, Mark Carney, who launched this um, with, with, with Bloomberg, who was behind it, um, has called on companies in the UK to do it now because you will be forced to do it in two years. So companies are asked to come up with calculations. If I carry on as company X to operate in this way, my contribution to overall global warming might be 2.4 degrees Celsius. Or if I'm doing better, it might just be 1.6. Because soon, this will have a real rep reputational impact on, on companies. And we, we talked about one or two uh, Taiwanese companies, some who are leading, leading the way. But the, the younger generation and consumers in three, five years, I can well imagine, will make their consumer decisions based on the, that kind of information. Um, what sort of commitments uh, are companies making to, to, to do their bit in, in the environment? And then also, companies need to be thinking about the impact of, of climate change on, on, on them. How will environmental changes affect their ability to operate and, and succeed as they are today. I'll just finish with two final graphs. So this is our energy mix, and, and we've seen similar graphs in uh, the previous presentation, but you can see that coal usage has come right down 
um, and renewables has significantly increased. Um, we are the we have the biggest capacity worldwide capacity for offshore wind of 8.5 gigawatts um, at the moment. But Taiwan is is aiming for 5.5 by 2025, so that's a, a good ambitious target. And then this this graph is very simple but very clear. The red line at the bottom shows how our emissions have reduced since 1990. The blue line at the top shows how our economy has grown. So this is a very simple, powerful symbol that you can easily grow your economy while reducing your carbon emissions. And this is sometimes something that we use to argue with businesses um, and other companies. Um, but my time is up, so uh, thank you again for giving me the opportunity to speak, uh, and I'll stop there. Thank you.